Hi, I'm George Lucas. I'm a professor of cybersecurity and I lead the research center at the University of Greenwich that specializes in the Internet of Things that used to not be on the Internet but now are. I'm talking about things like control systems in manufacturing. I'm talking about things like high-end cars that uh, you can update their software by connecting them to, the, to your Wi-Fi. Um, but for most of us, I'm talking about Google Home and Amazon Echo. I'm talking about things like baby cameras, smart thermostats, radiator valves, door locks, doorbells, these kinds of things. So things that until recently we would control only physically, manually, but um, over the last few years, we have started connecting to our Wi-Fi, to mobile apps. Uh, they might even have their own artificial intelligence to decide, for example, whether it is time to turn off the heating or whether the person at the front door is a member of the household. Until 10 or 15 years ago, most of us would have one device connected to our Wi-Fi, the computer. Now, many of us have dozens of devices. And it might feel like this happened suddenly. It might feel like this happened overnight. But it most certainly didn't. It was 100 years in the making. So Tesla, the original, was saying, had predicted, that when wireless is applied perfectly, the whole Earth will become a huge brain. And the devices we will use to connect to, the, to this huge brain will be so small they will fit in a vest pocket. And thanks to wireless, domestic life will be freed from all labor. But of course, no vision has ever materialized perfectly, right? It always comes with new risks. And in the case of the vast application of information and communication technologies, this risk was what we call cyber risk, cyber risks. So it came to the point that headlines like these ones have become commonplace. Cars and aircraft are vulnerable to computer malware in exactly the same way as computers. And in some places, cyber attacks were more damaging to cancer care than the actual pandemic. And how did we get to that point? How did we get to the point where, although it was a vision of 100 years, we now have so many risks to think about? In fact, some of the best minds in the world have worked on this aspect, on the cybersecurity and trustworthiness of information and communication technologies. And not only that, but the actual cybersecurity risks, they don't change that much. Uh, I'll give you an example. The top 10 of cybersecurity risks to web applications have not changed almost at all over the last 18 years. Some things, of course, have changed. For example, uh, the number of devices that are connected to the internet, uh, the scale in general, the complexity, the fact that we connect them to each other. Your smartwatch might be perfectly secure, but you might be connecting it to a mobile app or mobile phone that is not as secure. Nevertheless, all of these technical challenges as a scientific community we are fully on top of. There is something else that we are not really on top of. We know very well that more than half of the actual cybersecurity breaches happening in the real world have to do with a human error. We know that more than half are caused partially or fully by some form of human error. I click on something I shouldn't have clicked. Um, I am infected with a computer virus, and this computer virus finds its way through the company network, let's say, to the rest of the company, causing financial and other kinds of damage. More than half. By some accounts, way more than half, actually. Yet, when I counted this year's publications in the top three scientific conferences in cybersecurity, the ones that we call the A-star conferences in cybersecurity, I found that less than 4% of the publications had anything to do with the human factor. Less than 4%. And I was actually generous in counting that. So, in other words, you could say that as a scientific community, we are spending less than 4% of our effort to understand more than 50% of the problem. Why is that? Well, it's actually quite simple and obvious. The cybersecurity community is, is dominated by people like me, which means software engineers, network engineers, computer scientists, applied mathematicians, people who, when faced with some kind of problem, any kind of problem, they will look for a technical solution that will omit the human factor by choice. 
That's what we do. And when we have this kind of mentality, this means that the human factor for us is a source of uncertainty. And uncertainty, of course, is a problem for any system. And that matters. And I, let me explain why this matters. So led by my then PhD student, Ryan Hartfield, we challenged thousands of people online to try to detect as many cyber threats, cyber deception attempts against them as they could. We gave them examples like this one, uh, videos and screenshots like this one. For example, here, this, this looks like an Amazon login page. Uh, it even has a, a formal, a, a, a correct, let's say, Amazon address, but it is not Amazon Amazon. It is Amazon cloud service that anyone can rent. So out of the thousands of people that we asked, one in three got it wrong. That means that in a real situation, they would have input their, uh, their, their credentials there, and then that would be the beginning of a bigger cybersecurity incident for their organization. So one in three got it wrong. And that one in three is what everyone is focusing on. What do we do when this source of uncertainty, the one in three, happens? How do we make sure that it doesn't escalate into a worse case? How do we make sure that this stops there, that it doesn't become a bigger cybersecurity incident? Nobody looks at the two in three that actually got it right. Almost nobody looks at that. Everyone looks at the one in three because the human is a source of uncertainty. They never look at the two in three. So that's exactly what we did. We developed a simple tool that allowed people to report any kind of failed attempt at deceiving them. So any time that you receive an email that is, looks like um, a malicious email, let's say a phishing email, you report it. And then we developed 11 new attacks for a month-long experiment with 26 people. The, uh, what happened uh, was really interesting because these 11 attacks were not detected by any commercial security software. But any at all. No technical security system could develop these 11 attacks because they were new. We developed them just for that. But the human beings did a lot better. So the top is the red boxes. You see all the failures of technical security systems. At the bottom is, has, has both red and, and green. Green are successes, which is the human beings. Its column is a human being and its row is an attack. So you see that in practice, the human beings did a lot better than computer security systems are detecting these new attacks. And if you look at all the attacks, then 10 out of the 11 attacks were detected by at least one human being that we could have predicted with technology that we developed, and by no technical security measure. Isn't it remarkable how when you start seeing the human as a solution rather than as a problem, things change? However, that was 2018 which in our world, this is ancient history. It was about the web and email and about the social media that were popular at the time. When we tried the same thing in the Internet of Things, in other words, in smart home devices that we, most of us might be buying now, for example, that are commercially available, uh, the results were very different. Human beings did not do very well at all in that case. We had similar settings. Um, the users, the people were able to uh, use these devices, these smart home devices for weeks, yet and they knew they would be attacked. Yet when these things happened, when they were indeed attacked, either they didn't notice, or when they noticed it, they thought that it's just a device playing up again. And why is that? That's because smart devices are exceptionally complex. From a technology perspective, they're really complex. They have a number of sensors. They have um, artificial intelligence on board the device or perhaps remotely at the cloud server of the manufacturer. They have contextual information like the time, um, the location, whether you, you as a person, you're present at home. Um, they have uh, connections with other devices, they have connections with mechanical systems, with other systems within the home, they have automation rules, they have a number of different things. Yet, yet what you see as a user in practice is just this. Just a box, maybe a light, maybe a sound indicator. That's the most you might see. So there's not much you can go by. And this is a bit of a problem, because when things go wrong, it all looks really confusing to you. 
you don't know why it might have gone wrong. There is no cues. There is no information that you might be able to see. So you suddenly become, although until recently you were, um, you were the intelligent, responsible person that was, in, in, um, uh, let's say, able to mitigate two-thirds of the attacks that were attacking you, that were going against you, now you're reduced to, I would say, the role of the confused observer. And I don't like this at all. So, uh, well, together with, uh, the, with the universities of Bristol, uh, the University of Reading, uh, with Queen Mary um, and UCL, we have started a research project. It's called CHAI. It's funded by the UK Research and Innovation. And it is about finding new ways for devices to explain to us what they're doing. Why did they take this decision? Why, for example, they decided now to turn off the heating? Why did they decide that the person at the front door is a member of this household? So when things go wrong, when the artificial intelligence is maliciously uh, deceived by compromised sensors into thinking that this face is mine, or, that, or into thinking that uh, I'm not here, so they should turn off the heating, then I can recognize that something is wrong. I can recognize that this is not the normal behavior. And then I can again be in charge of my own safety and my own privacy. This is about seeing behind the curtain, in a sense. The, um, the whole project uh, will, of course, cultivate into uh, training programs, for example, so that as users you will know how to use um, smart devices. It will become best practice recommendations for manufacturers. But you should not wait for this. You should not just wait. In fact, remember, no company, no device manufacturer is more responsible than you for your own privacy and for your own safety. Nobody else. That means that just before you connect the next smart device to your Wi-Fi router, you should take a moment to think. You should take a moment to mentally visualize what will happen if someone who doesn't like you have control of this device for a minute or an hour or maybe a year. It might be about activating when it shouldn't activate. It might be about preventing it from activating when it should. Or it could be about monitoring you through its sensors and through its cameras. And if you don't like the answer to this question, then you should have a plan. You should have a plan to find out, for example, what can go wrong. And uh, how do you report things, perhaps to the manufacturer, that are beyond these natural faults? You should have a plan to find out how to disconnect it when you need to. You should have a plan to find out how to disable things that you don't need, functionalities that you don't need, like automation rules or other types of artificial intelligence that comes with this device and you might not need yet. And then enable them when you actually need them. But if it is about something like, let's say, a robotic vacuum cleaner, well, then in that case, what really can go wrong? And if the risk is really low, as in this case, well, like Tesla, I also like the idea of my domestic life being freed from some labor through the power of wireless and the device in my vest pocket. Thank you. <laughs>